so they're of his mind. Um, you'll see that the white space that's at the bottom keeps shrinking, right, as Max um, says, be still, and he takes over, and he becomes uh, the leader of all the wild things, right? He says, now let the wild rumpus begin. And then we have several pages of the wild rumpus where it's a two-page illustration. The moon is one of the constants uh, linking his bedroom to the land of the wild things. Although the moon waxes and wanes in size, um, it's something that's constant throughout. So we have several pages of this. But then he starts to feel lonely and it's dawn, right? Uh, connected back with uh, darkness and nighttime with sort of wildness and daylight with home. And so we'll sail, sail back home and we see the size of the pictures diminish again, right? He sails again. Now it's back to the half page where it's in the gutter and gets smaller until he's in his room. Right, and it's contained not with the white border, but it is still contained. And his dinner was there and it was still hot. And that the words even go onto this page where there's nothing. Right? So so it lets us know all about his sort of imagination. So that's part of the visual uh, whole book reading, a sort of quicker one because I wanted to show a few other books. Uh, the Journey by Aaron Becker, which is uh, another Caldecott um, Award uh, honor book, uh, very recent. It's sort of a grown-up version of Harold and the Purple Crayon, um, so that you will look. It's a wordless book. Wordless books are fantastic because you give it to the reader and you ask them what is happening, right? And so this is a whole book about her sort of boredom. Uh, you'll see the sort of uh, sepia tone, right, which is the sort of brown color that we associate with old films uh, with a little burst of red. And red for her is always going to be the color of imagination. She's sort of bored. She has her, um, her scooter, a kite, a basketball. Nobody wants to play with her. So she goes to her room and she's bored. Again, notice the size of the white borders early on and how it's going to change struggling with this upside down. She's in her room, she's bored, she sees the crayon, she draws, creates a red door, and enters two-page spread. And she enters into this magical world. And she'll go on a series of adventures, she'll like make a boat and sail through Venice, and she'll make a hot air balloon. Right, and I won't ruin it for you, but again, just seeing what the shape of the book, uh, what, what the sort of white space around a book does. Um, it's sort of beautifully uh, illustrated um, work for this uh, Aaron Becker's work. Uh, one place you can look to see what what is the sort of medium, sometimes it tells us on the sort of um, you know publication information page. So it's always worth looking there really quick. And it says the illustrations were done in watercolor and pen and ink. And you can look too and see, of course they were. They were done in pen and ink and watercolor. Okay. So uh, again, the sort of different mediums we have is really important. Radiant Child, which is the story of young artist uh, Jean, Jean-Michel uh, Basquiat, who is one of the great American, um, was sort of a graffiti artist. He was uh, one of Andy Warhol's sort of protégés, a uh, very big sort of artist throughout the 70s and 80s. So this is about him in New York City and getting inspiration from the city. Um, and the book is gorgeous. Uh, but what I want to point out is always looking to see if you can find about the, the sort of illustrator's note when possible. So that's why I want to point out here. Like Jean-Michel Basquiat, I used bits of New York City to create the artwork for this book. I painted on richly textured pieces of found wood 
harvested from discarded Brooklyn Museum exhibit materials, the dumpsters of Brooklyn brownstones, and the streets of Greenwich Village and the Lower East Side. In this way, I invite my readers to create using the materials, people, and places in their environment. While they, they will not find reproductions of ac of actual uh, Basquiat artwork in Radiant Child, they will find my original pieces that were inspired by him and my interpretation of his paintings and design. So that's what Jabico, Jabico Stepto uh, has done here. He offers a bibliography of the sort of artwork so you can see how it's painted on the boards. You can see the cracks through the wood. And that he took the discarded trash of New York City and made it art. If you learn about Basquiat's style, you will see that's what he did in his own artwork. So the medium here is especially important. Um, seeing all the sort of uh, crayon drawings that he did as a young boy, that's another medium that Basquiat worked with quite often was uh, crayons, which we don't often think of as high art sort of works. Um, but that's what he did. So the medium of, of what work does is really important. Thinking about the sort of color scheme, which we haven't even touched on, or warm colors or bright colors. We talked about that a little bit with the journey and where the wild things are. A few others I just wanna point out really quick. Uh, the Stinky Cheese Man and other fairly stupid tales uh, by John Sheska and Lane Smith. So. What I want to point out with this particular book is how important it is to pay attention to font, right? That font can do different things. And thinking about the formality of, um, and where the wild things are, it was quite a formal setup with font on one side, illustration on another. Here where it starts getting blurrier, right? Um, it starts getting closer. This art person is sort of going and getting in the way of the font. But thinking about what font does, um, and this is a bunch of sort of twisted fairy tale stories. This is a story about a giant squeezing somebody and as they squeeze them, squeeze them, you can see from the large font and the colored font to black and white font, it keeps getting smaller and smaller. I don't even know if I can read the very bottom. The giant laughed an ugly laugh. Right, so it gets so tiny down there. So also thinking about font and, and type and what that does. Um, sans serif font versus serif font. Um, crossing through the font. Not the end, right? That's sort of crossing through. So this one, um, the illustrations are great, but the font work, what, what's being done with the, the type is really fantastic. Trombone Shorty, which is another Caldecott honor book, and is about um, a, a great sort of uh, trombone player from New Orleans. It was written by Troy Trombone Shorty Andrews and illustrated by Brian Collier. And this is another sort of one um, where I just want to point out a few things, right? So where you at, where you at, where you at. And so there's going to be this sort of repetition, which is, so it's sort of creating the sort of New Orleans sort of soundscape for you, uh, how New Orleans sort of music and jazz there works. Yeah. But it's sort of cartoon panels, right? So it's sequential art here of trombone, Shorty playing a song, three slightly different vantage points as he's going along. We can see how the font is working Right, and we can see uh, the sort of swirl sound coming out of his trombone. One thing that's really beautiful in this book is how it incorporates photographs. Um, I want to find a particular image of Trombone Shorty when he gets a sort of big break and he goes and gets to play a concert. But it will sort of blur um, paints on top of photographs. All right, here we go. So underneath a sort of overpass in New Orleans, you can see there are photographs that have been painted over to create this not quite photorealistic, but this very effective uh, artwork throughout for Trombone Shorty. It's lively, it's engaging, it is jazz. Speaking of that, the one I want to end with uh, for today 
I have two more to look at quickly. Uh, Duke Ellington uh, by Andrea Davis Pinkney and Brian Pinkney. So they're part of uh, one of the most important sort of African American children's literature dynasties of um, uh, artists, illustrators, and writers. But Duke Ellington, one of the great uh, jazz players. I'm skipping the whole book approach by accident, but we have our dust jacket, right? Learning to read all that, even if you don't always with students, read it for yourself. But here we have this beautiful scratch board design, which is when you begin with something that's all black and you scrape away to get um, the sort of illustrations underneath. But it's all these bright, vibrant colors. And it, um, especially when Duke Ellington plays, it looks like music. It looks like jazz, right? We can hear the orchestra when we look at these sort of illustrations. I would also be playing some Duke Ellington for students if we read that out loud. And finally, this book, The Whisper, which um, I, I might make a separate video for it later on. Um, written and illustrated by Pamela Zagorensky, uh, who's uh, won two Caldecott honors. And so she takes, uh, this is one of the reasons why the full book approach is important. On, um, on our uh, flyleaf, what we see here is a fox looking at grapes. If you know uh, classical children's literature, you might recognize this as an Aesop's tale of the fox and the sour grapes. I happen to have a signed copy, by the way. This is a motif, and we see the fox. While I'm not going to read the book here, what I'm going to point out is seeing that fox there is absolutely essential for understanding the rest of the book, which is about a little girl who takes a book home and all the book words spill out. And so she has a series of illustrations and she has to write the stories for them. So it's very interactive. Um, I would, with students, I wouldn't even read the story she writes. I would have them write their own stories is the way that I would approach this. But she works with the fox. Uh, he gives her the words for the story and she gives him the grapes. And then uh, we have this sort of coda at the end that says what the source tale is. And it is from the Aesop fable about the fox and the grapes. So I'll just leave that as a little hanging um, one to tantalize you the way that Willie's stories did uh, with the library books. And, um, and we'll look at this one soon. Thank you.